going somewhere. Yes, headed to the theater. Ooh, I like those. Thanks, well, you know what they say, it's the shoes that make the outfit. Really, is that what they say? What? Nothing, darling, I was just wondering, when was your last sojourn to the salon? The hood of the hut? You need to get your hair done. Yes, I know, I just haven't had the time. I think the most important thing a woman can have, next to talent, of course, is her hairdresser. Really? You're quoting Joan Crawford? I liked her, darling. So sweet. You do realize that whatever my hair looks like... You Oh, darling, I know, you're a busy modern woman. It's just that it's not always about the buffer base. Sometimes we need to attend to the treble. <laughs> well, the treble, yeah. I'll get right on that. Good for you, darling. I'm Andy. Welcome to Furniture Fables. It is undeniable a truly impactful way of updating any piece of furniture is to add feet where once there were none. But when I met this fellow 70s baby, I was immediately concerned with her top. And while a new stone top would have been, of course, incredible, I knew that if I wanted to keep any kind of budget in mind, I would have to summon whatever woodworking skills I could. I picked up this 1970s buffet slash credenza just a couple miles from home from a nice family who was busy with a decluttering project. The dad explained I should be careful. That big unattached top was extremely heavy and he was not kidding. I know that in these pictures, this faux slate top is maybe appearing a bit greenish, but in person it wasn't, friends. It was blue. And not an appealing blue, at least not to me. And with all of that uneven, dramatic movement, it was giving me all kinds of Flintstones vibes. So I stood and I looked and I looked at that top, trying to think how I could use it in a redesign. But in the end, for me, there was no question it had to go. And that meant one thing, creating a new top. The ornate original brass hardware I was warming up to, and so I thought I'd probably be keeping that. But after I removed the top and stood back to look at the piece some more, I also started to think that she could perhaps use a new pair of shoes. So I added that to the to-do list as well. I took out the three interior drawers and placed them off to the side and then removed all of that fabulous original brass hardware. I then mixed up a bucket of warm soapy water. I always use Dawn dishwashing soap and gave the whole piece a good cleaning inside and out, and then rinsed it well and dried it. Then I removed the four doors, making sure to carefully label them and their hardware so that they could find their way back home to their original spots. And then I started painting. <laughs> yes, that's correct. We're already to this part so quickly. I am using the color Bayberry by Fusion Mineral Paint. And that's correct, no scuff sanding or priming. So why not? Well, the original surfaces were that incredible combination of not slick and 
in basically perfect condition. They did have a strong oak grain showing, but I actually kind of wanted that oaky texture to read through the paint. Fusion has a built-in primer, which I knew would be great for adhesion. And so I knew that as long as I didn't see any bleed through on this first door, I was going to be in business. Luckily, my hunch paid off, no bleed through at all, and so I was off to the races, applying my first coat over the entire body of the buffet. It's pretty rare that I don't do any sanding or priming, but every once in a while I will come across a project where I think it's the right call, and this was one of them. These doors took a little extra time to paint with all of their three-dimensional details and I found that actually going back and forth between my zebra chiseled wedge brush and my smaller square brush made it really easy to get into and around all of those details. Whew. Even after all of that, still missed a couple of spots there, but that's okay, we'll get those on the second coat. So Bayberry is just like its name. It's very much the color of a bay leaf you may have in your spice cupboard. The color will look really different throughout this video depending on the light, but it is a very earthy mid-toned green. Here you can see as I start the second coat on this door how that oak grain is showing through. After this coat dried, I took a little bit of 220 grit sandpaper and I gently sanded down any little rough spots I felt on those doors and then wiped them down with a tack cloth before adding a third coat. Okay, so now it was finally time to start to address that top. I took some measurements of the old slate top, that's it flipped over, and then John and I ran over to Home Depot for some supplies. We started by tracing the outline of the top of the piece onto a piece of 5 8 inch plywood that we had purchased and then cutting that down to size so that it would fit perfectly on the top of the buffet. So whenever I need to use the circular saw, I really prefer for John to do the first cut so I can kind of remind myself by watching him just exactly how to do it. Saws generally don't scare me, but I've just used them a lot less than he has, and so it's great for me to get a little refresh before I grab it out of his hands. <laughs> Saws are fun. <laughs> Saws can be fun. I gave the edges of that plywood a quick sand and then fitted the piece on top of the buffet 
and then pre-drilled some holes and screwed it onto the top. My plan was to use this plywood piece as a base and do a planked look with some select quality pine boards that we had also purchased. Before I put the pine boards on top though, I decided this was a good point to spiff up the fronts of the interior drawers. I gave all three of them a good sanding with a 220 grit paper, and then I brightened them up with some Dixie Belle gel stain in Picklin White. I used the Dixie Belle applicator pad to wipe on that gel stain, and then used some lint-free cloths to wipe it back. Okay, so all this time I had also been thinking about those feet and I decided I really wanted to add some. So with John's help, I flipped that buffet over and we took a look at the construction of the underside and realized that I was going to need to essentially build up the bottom a bit so that there would be something strong to really screw a furniture foot into. If you have a piece like this that you would like to add feet to, uh, and it looks like this, here is what you can do. We cut a piece of two by two oak, oak because it, you know it's just so strong, so that it would fit against the existing structure of that underside. And then because it was a little too short, we used some scraps to create some shims And now you can see that oak piece is nice and flush with the bottom edge of the buffet. And then I used some good wood glue to attach those shims and the oak piece. And then I clamped that oak piece to the side of the buffet and then came back and pre-drilled some holes from the top and the side so that we could secure that piece of oak with screws both from the top and the sides to make it really, really secure. You can see John there is making sure that that drill bit is the right length. So it's going to go through the oak as well as a bit of the buffet. Okay, once we had installed those oak pieces on both sides, it was time to install the feet hardware. I measured where I wanted the foot to sit and then scratched the surface to mark that spot. And then we used that wood drill to create a hole for the hardware to sit down into. Not quite, needs a little bit more. There it goes, nice and flush. Before you pre-drill anything, you want to compare your bits to the screws that you'll be using so that you can match those up as close as possible. Pre-drilling is really important with oak because it's just so strong your screws will not go in by themselves. And there they are, beautiful furniture feet mounts, ready for any style of shoe you would like to try. <laughs> and of course, I just so happen to have a few different sets on hand and I just couldn't resist, so I tried them all on. Now, I knew that with that existing apron, finding just the right foot might be a bit of a challenge and 
You could obviously remove the apron to create a more streamlined look, but my goal here was to create maximum options so that somebody could have furniture feet or they could remove the feet and have the piece sitting on the floor as it did originally, if they preferred that look. Those long modern ones look a little silly. Okay, leaving the final shoe choice for later and back to the top, I measured my top's base and added an inch for overhang and then I cut down my three pine boards to fit and gave them all a good sanding. Then I used some more of that tight bond glue and installed that first board using a clamp to let it dry for about an hour and then coming back and using my nail gun. Again here, whenever you use your nail gun, you want to measure the depth of whatever it is you're trying to nail into, making sure that your nails are not too short or too long. I added the second board gluing it down and clamping it to the first one so that it was nice and tight up against it and then nailed it down as well. That third board, I couldn't fit the clamp around so I just did my best and glued and nailed it down as well. Now you may be wondering why I didn't trim that little front angle on the first board before installing it. Honestly, I wasn't sure if maybe a squared top would look better on this buffet, but I decided that no, it really should be angled to match the whole piece. Um, so I had to measure off that little bit there on that corner and use the circular saw to trim it off. This is not ideal. I really should have done it the other way around, but it did work. Then I remeasured my boards and I cut and sanded my pieces of one by two pine trim, gluing and then nailing them in. You can see that these trim pieces will cover the edges of the plywood base as well as those pine planks and so giving the top a really nicely finished appearance. I have to apologize, I somehow did not get footage or I've lost the footage of when I created the little corner angled pieces. But once that top was all installed, I got out my wood filler and I dabbed it over every nail as well as all of the cracks at that those angled corners. And I also put a little bit in between the planks as well. The idea here was not to disguise the planks. Actually, on the contrary, the planks, in my opinion, were part of the design, but to just kind of minimize any gaps. Once that had all dried, I gave everything one last sanding and then I got out the stain. This is my very dented can of Briar Smoke Stain by Verathane. This is a really cool smoky brown tone that I thought would go great with the bayberry green. I gave the stain a really good stir and then using an older brush, I began applying it brushing it on in the direction of the wood grain in small sections, and then wiping it back with the same lint-free cloths. Now, because I am staining pine, I knew I would have a lot of contrast and variation. Pine, of course, has wood knots and 
those will add to all kinds of variation in terms of how the wood takes the stain. But again, I thought that would actually work really nicely with the kind of overall modern rustic vibe that I was going for. While that first coat dried, I got out the feet that I was going to use and I stained them to match using that briar smoke stain again, brushing it on and then wiping it off with those lint-free cloths. I decided just to do one coat on the feet. I actually kind of preferred them looking extra rustic. Then I did a second coat of stain on the top of the piece, brushing it on, letting it sit for just a minute and wiping it off. And then I let that dry for a good three days before I added my top coat. I used two coats of Verathane's Poly Top Coat in flat. Again, I have to apologize. I am missing that footage. <laughs> but if you have seen me add top coat before, you know the drill. You want to stir that top coat gently, lay it down with overlapping strokes, and most importantly, if you are applying a water-based top coat over an oil-based stain, you must wait at least 72 hours. You may have noticed that I really like to brighten up the inside of darker pieces. And so for a final touch on this buffet, I used a little bit of this white and gold metallic bumblebee paper on the back of the inside of the buffet, using my utility knife to gently trim it up. I added some pads to my new feet and then screwed them in. Then it was time to put back those freshly brightened drawers. And then I put all of the original hardware back, gently nailing those original little nails back in. Then I reattached those doors to their original spots. And then I decided at the last second here to add a little bit more paper to the inside of those doors. Okay, do you remember our 70s comma stone age storage? With that top that could flatten some toes as she sat flat on the floor? And here she is now. Sometimes a fresh haircut and new shoes can do wonders, along with the perfect green dress. With that heavy stone top gone and everything in that bayberry color, we can now somehow see the architectural details of those doors all the more clearly. 
while the aged patina of the original brass hardware warms the piece with its vintage, low luster shine. The interior has been refreshed with brighter drawer fronts and some simple but beautiful and removable liner paper. Her new dandy shoes get her up off the floor, giving the piece a more light and airy visual appeal, while balancing all of the existing three-dimensional design elements. With a new modern rustic elegance, she really has been updated from head to toe. This credenza slash buffet was a great learning piece for me. I had done a planked top before in the past, but this was the first time I had done a larger piece like this. Now, obviously with all of that lumber and the new feet, a project like this is not going to be on the cheaper end. And I believe my total cost for supplies was right at about $120. I listed and sold the piece for $385, and at that price, it went quick with several offers, giving me a modest profit of $265. Remember, I tend to price things kind of on the lower end when I'm doing a technique that is new to me. If I were to do a piece just like this now, I think I would list it somewhere in the neighborhood of $450 to $485. And I think it would probably sell just as easily. I hope you enjoyed this head to toe makeover and are encouraged to see the potential in your furniture. If so, make sure to click that subscribe button before you go. How different would that old dated piece in your home look with a new do and some new shoes? <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me, my friends. I will see you next time for more Furniture Fables.